guys, welcome back to my channel and another video. Today I'm going to show you how I painted this pretty dahlia flower and bumblebee piece using watercolours, and I'll be sharing my six top tips for painting realistic florals, as well as talking you through some of the techniques I use to paint the bee. So I hope you enjoy the video and find it useful. All the materials I'll be using will be listed in the description box below, along with a link to the reference photo from Pixabay if you want to try this painting out for yourself. So my first tip for painting realistic florals is to make sure your initial outline sketch is very light, as you don't want the sketch lines to be visible on the finished piece. If you're using a graphite pencil for your sketches and have one with a harder lead like a 2H for example, then you could use that, or alternatively you could lift off some of the graphite using a kneaded eraser. Another option would be to draw out your outline sketch using a watercolour pencil or coloured pencil that matches the colour of your flower, but whatever you choose, make sure it's as light as possible. My sketch is a bit darker here, so it shows up on the video. My next tip is to plan ahead, so this means deciding which part of the painting to start with, swatching out your colours before you start, and thinking about which techniques you want to use. When painting in watercolour, it's a good idea to paint light to dark, building up colour gradually. So, as tempting as it was to start by painting the bumblebee, I knew it would make more sense to begin with the lighter flower petals, as this would reduce the chance of any dark paint bleeding from the bee into the pale pink petals if it got wet. Tip number three is to paint one petal or section at a time, and the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, it helps to simplify the painting process. A dahlia flower head like this can look really complicated and difficult to paint as a whole, but if you break it down into smaller, more manageable parts, it is much less complicated or daunting, and then it's just a case of methodically painting each petal. The second reason I like to do this is because each petal in nature will be slightly different. No one petal will be exactly the same in terms of colour, value or details, so by painting each one individually, and by using your reference photo to help you, you can really pay attention to these variations, and achieve a more natural and realistic looking painting at the end. Painting one petal at a time also gives you a bit more time to use techniques like the wet in wet technique as working on smaller sections means you don't have to rush to finish a larger area before your paper dries. I love mixing my watercolours together on the surface of the wet paper, and I was able to really relax and take my time with each petal using this methodical approach. It's not the only way to paint realistic florals, but I find it quite therapeutic. So I pre-wet each petal with clean water first before dropping in paint. These petals here, I thought, had cooler undertones, so I mixed opera rose with a bit of alizarin crimson and a tiny bit of ultramarine blue, and I varied this paint mix slightly according to what I could see on my reference photo. I also added in some yellow ochre light whilst the paper was still damp. Now, before we go into tip four, I just wanted to mention another option for lightening your sketch. You'll notice here that before I pre-wet my paper, I use my kneaded eraser to lift some of the graphite off my paper first. And this is an option if you'd rather not do the whole lot at once at the beginning. It can be really helpful if your eyesight isn't so good, your lighting isn't so good, or you simply don't want to lose sight of your initial sketch. I like to do it sometimes as it gives me a bit more control and confidence of what I'm doing, especially in a piece that's a bit more intricate like this but you can only lift graphite from dry paper. Once it's been wet, even with water, it won't lift at all. So that's something to bear in mind, but it is another option. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to painting the right-hand side of this dahlia, and for this, I wanted to use some warmer pink tones. So I'm mixing in some of my Daniel Smith's Buff Titanium to the Opera Rose, and you can see the slightly warmer tones swatched out. I then continued on painting individual petals as before, which brings me on to tip number four, which is not to paint two petals next to each other unless the first one is completely dry. If you do, you risk the colours bleeding together or getting backgrounds formed where the paper is at different levels of wetness. 
To avoid this, I paint a petal, skip a petal, then paint another petal. And then when the first one is completely dry, I can go and paint the one next to it that I skipped. Your painting might look a bit patchy during this process, but it's worth doing to prevent spoiling any of your hard work. Moving on to tip number 5 next, and that's to work in light layers. Again, this could apply to any watercolour painting, but it's especially helpful to build up your layers gradually when painting something as light and delicate as flower petals. Watercolour is a transparent medium, and it's much easier to go darker by applying another layer than it is to lift out the colour later on. So once I had painted my first light layer all over the flower and my paper had completely dried, I could go back over the areas that needed to be darker and build up the values gradually using my reference photo as a guide. For this layer, you can either re-wet each petal again and use the wet in wet technique to add more paint, or as I like to do, apply paint to dry paper and soften out any hard edges with a clean damp brush, so more like a glaze but it's up to you and you can continue to add as many layers as you need until you get the desired results you're after. But just make sure that each layer is completely dry before you add the next one. With that all done, tip number six is make any adjustments and add any details. So I use my Dr. PH Martin's Bleed Proof White Ink here just to neaten up some of the brightest highlights on the petals. If you haven't got this, you can use white gouache white gel pen or white colour pencil. Alternatively, you can mask out these areas at the start using masking fluid. Either way is fine, but I decided to go with this method today. So once I was happy with the values, level of contrast and detail on my dahlia and everything had dried, it was time to paint the bee. And for this part of the video, I thought I'd talk about the techniques I'd used and why. I decided not to do a background for this piece and instead keep it quite simple. I wondered about painting the bee in a looser style, but decided that painting wet on dry would really help to make the details on the bee stand out and contrast well with the softer colours and details on the petals. The reference photo I used also showed a huge amount of detail in the bee's hair and on the wings, and I thought it would be really fun to try and replicate that in my painting. I started off by painting the lightest parts of the bee's body using light yellow ochre and my size 8 silver black velvet brush, and then dropped in some quinacrinone gold. This brush, despite being a size 8, does hold a really nice fine point, and I used the very tip of it to paint in the hairs on the bee's body. I looked at the length and direction of the hairs on the reference photo and tried to match that with my brush strokes, just painting on dry paper. Whilst I was waiting for the yellow area to dry, I mixed up some black, and for this I used the ultramarine blue that was already on my palette, as well as some sepia. I switched over to a Princeton snap brush in a size 2, as this has a firmer point, and I thought it would be really good for filling in the details on the bee's legs. Again, I applied this just onto dry paper. This enabled me to have precision and control on these really detailed areas. I used this same brush and the same colour just to outline the darkest part of the wings too. Once this had dried, I could then go in and add some colour to the wings. And for this, I just watered down the black I'd made, and also used some watery sepia as well. There are a lot of colours in the wings that I could see from the reference photo, so I also added in some blue as well. 
and was careful to leave some white for the highlights. It was back to my size 8 brush and more of my black mix to paint the really dark hairs on the bee's head and body. And I really enjoyed this part as it really started to make the painting come to life. When I came to paint the legs, I added more sepia to my black as I thought they looked more brown than the body. It's really interesting how a bee can hold on to delicate flower petals with these claw-like feet. For the dark hair on the body, I went back to the light flicking strokes with the tip of my brush. I used my brush almost dry here, as I thought it would help add a fluffy texture to the bee. The dry brush also skipped over some areas of the paper, which left some natural lighter areas in the hair. When it came to painting the second band of black hair, I flicked my brush into the yellow hair from the black rather than the other way around, and used this tapered stroke to try and create the finest details I could see on the reference photo. Then once this was dry, it was just a case of repeating the process with another layer to make sure I had my darkest colours as dark as they needed to be. I also mixed up a darker orange colour using the alizarin crimson and the quinacrolone gold and painted it between the black and yellow stripes. Now another thing I sometimes like to do on my watercolour paintings is to add some coloured pencil just to sharpen up some of the details. These offer a much more opaque covering than my watercolours, so it saves me time adding lots and lots more layers. I wanted to add some really dark details inside the wing, as well as add a few more individual hairs to make this bumblebee look extra fuzzy. I tried using a cream pencil to add in some of the pollen covering the bee's body, but this didn't really show up as much as I wanted it to, so I ended up mixing some white gouache with a bit of the yellow ochre and dotting it in with my brush. This was a lot more effective. Now before I go, I have one last tip for you, and that is to look at future painting projects, not in terms of how difficult or complicated they might seem, but instead think about how you could break it down into smaller, more manageable steps like I did for the flower petals on this dahlia. Just take it one step at a time and you might surprise yourself. Pushing yourself out of your comfort zone can be, well, uncomfortable, but it's a really fast way to improve your art skills. Let me know what you thought of this painting and if you have any other tips for painting florals or bees in watercolour, then let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, have a good weekend, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.